Crabtree Jones House is a very old home in Raleigh, North Carolina. It was built around 1810 by Nathaniel Jones, who was also known as Crabtree Jones. The house sat happily on a hill for over 200 years, a couple of miles from downtown Raleigh. The house was out in the country when it was built, but by 1960, it sat just inside the Beltline. After 40 years of sitting on property zoned for commercial use, progress threatened in the form of a new apartment complex. Destruction of Crabtree Jones House was a clear and present danger. Preservation North Carolina, with cooperation from the Raleigh Historic Development Commission, hatched a plan to take the home on a short but challenging journey to safety. The plan was a success, and Crabtree Jones House now sits at 3108 Hilmer Drive in Raleigh, still at the top of the hill. And it's been beautifully renovated by the new owners, Matt Hobbs and Katie O'Brien. Myra Howard, president of Preservation North Carolina, is joining us to share more of the story. Hi, Myra. Hey, Paul. Thank you for joining us. We want to hear more about the Crabtree Jones House story, but First, tell us a little bit about Preservation North Carolina. Well, Preservation North Carolina uh, has a property program that's sort of like an animal shelter for historic buildings. And we try to save the poor dogs that nobody else uh, will deal with. And the Crabtree Jones House is that kind of property. Um, we would have lost this property if we hadn't gotten involved and you know, actually bought it, bought the land. Uh, and, and moved it. We joke about our dogs, and this is definitely a dog that was not just with mange and blind and three-legged, but it was running right beside the interstate, in this case literally, uh, and was in really deep trouble. Like an animal shelter, we try to find somebody who will take these poor pups and get them back into good health and take good care of them. So we normally just try to find a good steward for these properties. We've done it with about 800 properties all across the state. been doing it for about 40 years, and it's been very exciting to see these properties come back to life. Okay, great. Very cool. It's uh, an admirable mission and an impressive history of success. Let's jump over to the house, Crabtree Jones House. First, the name, Crabtree. Uh, I know his name was Nathaniel, but any insights on why Crabtree? Well, there were several Nathaniel Jones of prominence in Wake County about that time. So he was referred to as Crabtree Jones because of the proximity of his home to Crabtree Creek. There was also a White Plains Jones who lived uh, near Cary on White Plains. Um, so it was, it was simply a way of identifying him from from other Nathaniel Jones in Big County. I like Crabtree. It's a cool name. No offense to Nathaniel, but Crabtree's cool. It's all over town now. There's a lot of Crabtree. What about the significance of this particular home? Why was it worth all this effort to save? Well, the Crabtree Jones House is really one of the finest federal houses in in White County, and it may be the oldest house in Raleigh that's still a residence. There are a couple of houses that are, two or three houses that are older. For example, the Joel Lane House, which is a museum, the Mordecai House, the back part of the Mordecai House is, is older. Uh, it's also a, a museum. But this is, was the first one, the, the earliest one that stayed in, in residential use all those years. Just a really fine early house for, for Wake County, and a lot of folks knew the house, and a lot of folks worried about the house for for decades, literally. In the 1960s, this correspondence about the for sale sign that went out in front of the house in the late 1960s, uh, advertising it as land, shall we say. But it's right at the intersection of a big four-lane road uh, and a interstate, so it's right at the interchange where there are bank buildings and a shopping center and hotels and so forth. And then you had this house sitting on several acres. Yeah, and interestingly, it was very, very well hidden. I drove by it many times and didn't realize it was there because behind all the trees. Well, that's because during those 40 years, the trees grew up. Oh. <laughs> <You> know, it, <laughs> 
Back in the 1960s, it sat on the hill very proudly with uh, big trees around it and, a, you know, kind of a, a carriage drive in front of it. And actually, the road got moved as well. The road was closer to the house before the interstate was built. And so the, the road was straightened out much earlier. And the house, it was in the later years that it, that it grew up, the, the woods grew up around it. So it was a bit of a mystery for a lot of folks. The date uh, that is now being used for construction of the house is 1810. And I understand there's still some mystery uh, regarding that. The, the actual marker for the house is the date is 1795. When we got involved with the house, there, there was a lot of question about when it was built. So we hired a company to come in and date it using the tree rings of the wood. Tree rings, in a wet year, they're fat. In a, in a dry year, they're skinny. So you can kind of look at 1914 if it was a wet year and it kind of stands out. And then, you know, 1893 was a wet year and that stands out. You could take existing trees and then connect them to earlier trees and, and figure out these dates. So we had that done on the house. The main house came out as being built uh, right around 1810. The back part of the house, we weren't sure about uh, whether it was earlier, whether it got moved up to the back of the house, whether it was just a later addition. And we really still don't know the answer to that question with certainty, we, we think at this point probably is an addition. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason we don't know for certain is there was a goodly amount of termite damage to the wood so that you couldn't get a good boring. You really have to go through good wood to get the kind of boring needed to do the computer analysis, uh, to do dendrochronology, as it's called, the, the look of the tree rings. In any event, it was built right around the time, within a decade or so after Raleigh was officially founded. So it's it's been here for the history. And actually, Nathaniel Jones was one of the people who met at uh, Isaac Kenner's Tavern to select the location for the city of Raleigh. So very direct connection there. Anything you can share about the process of this journey to saving the house and the move. How was that experience? Well, it was really complicated one in, in a sense. For years, I had met with the developer who owned, owned the property for years. Very nice man who consistently said, don't worry, I'm not going to tear it down. If, you know, if it ever comes to such, we'll figure out a way to move it. And I'd say, well, we really would rather not move it if we don't have to, but is sitting on really expensive land. But as it ends up, he passed away, his wife passed away, the property was put up on the market, bought by an out-of-state developer. It was very nice to work with. We met with him as soon as we heard the news that he had bought it. Since the property was designated as a local landmark, he was going to have to wait a year to tear it down anyway. So we, we talked with him, and the fact that we could try to move the house with some support from him, which helped him kind of go through the process. Um, he had every right to tear down after waiting a year, but it was great working with him. And then the next thing was figuring out where to move it. So went over to that neighborhood, walked around the neighborhood, and there were two or three sites that we thought, mm, maybe that's a good place to move it. One in particular was just immediately adjacent to the, the land that the, the Jones house was sitting on. And I knew somebody who lived nearby, and I called her up, and she said, well, you're not going to believe this, but the owner of that property was just taken to a nursing home last week. I mean, kind of like, this is weird. So I called up her son and said, don't mean to be a vulture, but uh, any chance you'd be willing to, to sell this house? To us, we would demolish the house and put the Crabtree Jones house on its site. And he said, uh, yes, and that his mother always loved the Crabtree Jones house and wanted to buy it in the 1960s, but his father didn't want to buy the house. So he thought his mother would feel very, very good about the process. So it, it was, it all just kind of played out. We, we bought the house. 
we deconstructed it. We used a lot of the building materials for a project that we were working on over in Durham. It, it, was, a, it was a big move because it's, the Kirkford Jones house is over 3,000 square feet. It has three chimneys that are early 19th century chimneys. We moved it all in one piece to the new site. Uh, the, the move took about two hours. Fascinating to watch because it was done using uh, robotically controlled equipment. No truck pulling the, the house along as one might envision. Each of the dollies had its own electric motor and, and they were all computerized in the way of you know, kind of keeping the house level and moving all at the same speed and so forth. It's really interesting to watch. Yeah, I, I was there watching it as well, along with lots of other people, and it was it was fascinating to see this fellow driving this monster down the hill by remote control. <laughs> yeah, the house the house mover gave me the box and said, "You want to drive this thing?" It's kind of like, not on your life. <laughs> Heck no, <laughs> don't want responsibility for that. I'm not touching that, right? Uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh. One thing I should say is one, one of the complications we ran into that we had no idea is that when we were building the uh, putting in the foundations and footings for the, the house on the new site we hit granite <laughs> there's a pretty good little load of granite there was actually a, a a quarry only about a quarter mile away and part of the hill was granite and uh, i remember that when they got the house down the hill they had to didn't they have to do a 180 and turn it around to back it in well, actually, the 180 was done at the top of the hill before it was moved. Wow. It was moved rear, rear first onto the okay. new site, so it was a straight okay. shot. Back. I knew it had to be. Sorry, I knew it had to be turned. I just didn't remember. The News Observer did a time lapse of it that's still available on YouTube. If you just go on YouTube and search uh, Crippery Jones House, it's, it's still there. It's very cool to watch, but it's funny to watch because. If you look at it carefully, it's coming down the hill, coming down the hill, coming down the hill. And then there's this little moment where it tilts and then continues coming down the hill. And they had a, a tire blowout in the process. So they, they had to actually do some repairs on the equipment while uh, the, the house was midway. And it's kind of amusing to watch that little tilt keeps moving. Oh, my gosh. I missed that. The other nice thing about this story is that the neighborhood, which appropriately is called Crabtree Heights, the neighbors were very supportive, which was very nice. Absolutely. And the, the graves from the Jones family is in the middle of this neighborhood, only a couple hundred feet away from the house. So the house is literally within sight now of the, the, the family cemetery. And in the small world of things, the next door neighbor is somebody we have known for years, and she won one of our awards probably 10 years ago for some work she's done in eastern North Carolina. So then uh, you got the house moved, you got it stabilized, but it was still in a state of disrepair, and you needed somebody to take care of it, to renovate it. The buyers that were found. Their names are Matt Hobbs and Katie O'Brien, and they seem to be the perfect buyers. Tell us a little bit about them. Well, we were really delighted to, to get the offer from from Matt and Katie. We had a goodly number of folks look at the house, and you know, some were terrified, and others were were intrigued. Matt had had some some experience renovating houses. In fact, he had bought a house from us in the late 1990s down in Edenton. Uh, in the Edenton Cotton Mill Village, and he, he renovated one of the mill houses down there under our covenants years ago, and we had some contact with him through the years. So when he made an offer on this house, I was going, this is great. This is somebody we're comfortable with. He knows renovation. Katie was a delight to work with, terrific buyers. Uh, they were able to get their financing without any real trouble. Not that getting financing and is a cakewalk and when you deal with this kind of house, if you can imagine. Here's a house with no systems whatsoever, i.e., I mean, you don't even have a water line from the street to the house at this point, much less any sort of workable plumbing, you know, kitchen, bathrooms. None of that was working, no heating, cooling. Uh, it was really a start from scratch 
renovation in terms of systems. The house was good and secure, solid, well built. We had repaired some areas where there were problems, and Katie had the steel nerves to go forward with this project. Looks so good. Yeah, kudos to them. And they had a couple of others, other key players helping them. Uh, ben Hobbs is Matt's dad, and then uh, another Matt. Uh, Matt. Yeah. Ben Hobbs is a furniture maker who's really well known uh, in eastern North Carolina. That's, that's Matt Hobbs' father. Matt Hobbs himself does some furniture making on the side. Beautiful, beautiful work. But uh, his father makes uh, kind of reproduction furniture. He's got furniture in some, you know, Williamsburg places. He's got furniture in some important houses all over eastern North Carolina. So very well known for beautiful woodworking. And so uh, Matt and his father did a lot of the um, renovation work themselves in terms of dealing with the, the mantles, the, the woodwork, preserving the marbleizing, the, the faux marble painted baseboards. Uh, and, and I think it was, it's a nice story about the father coming for weekends and, and working with his son on this house. Also involved in it was Matt Swain, who's a young carpenter, a kind of master of many, many trades, amazing work ethic. And, and we got tickled because the neighbors would refer to Matt Hobbs as Big Matt and Matt Swain as Little Matt because Matt Hobbs is maybe six or eight inches taller than Matt Swain. Matt Swain, Little Matt, uh, worked for Preservation North Carolina on a contract basis preparing the house for the move. So he's the one who tore off the later porch. He's the one who did quite a bit of work to stabilize the house before the move. He was there all the way through the process of the move. He was there working with us to help do some some work after the house was on the new site. So he, he was involved in this project really from the first lifting of the crowbar to the last lifting of the handle, uh, hammer. Start to finish. Sounds like it's almost the perfect, if not the perfect, team to take on this project. I wanted to back up a little bit because you talked about, you know, the house being stabilized and, and that there was some termite damage and all that. But I re when the house was up on wheels uh, at the top of the hill, we had the opportunity to walk around underneath it. The construction it was amazing. It was such heavy, heavy, heavy timbers. And I also noticed that those timbers were marked with Roman numerals so that mm -hmm. apparently that's how they knew what went where, right? That these houses were put together, or that house was put together, all, I hate to say, like a kit house. Well, uh, of sorts, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, almost certainly the Crabtree Jones house would have been built with enslaved labor. Um, the male slaves were some of the highest skilled carpenters of that period of, of North Carolina history. And what they would do is they, it's literally one of those cases, you chop down a tree, you take it to the, the mill, the water-powered mill, you know, they dress it and bring it back to the site, and they would have to chisel out the places where the next piece was connected into it. And so they do this work on, on the ground, and they do a you know a Roman numeral one on the piece that's connecting and the Roman number one on the piece that's being connected into it. So they kind of build it as a uh, as a unit and then put it on the foundation. And it, you see it a lot, for example, in ceiling or in, in roof structures where the roof structures are being built on the ground and then taken up to the, the roof. Uh, one by one and then connected. And since it's all hand done, you got to make sure that number six fits number six uh, because they are number six might not fit <laughs> number five. Very highly skilled and beautiful woodwork uh, in terms of the, 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 the structure itself. And it would have all been hand planed. It would have been, uh, for example, it was fascinating, the, the stair noodle, the, the trim piece at the bottom of the stair, went through the floor about six inches and was connected uh, or had a peg put into it right under the floor so that, I mean, it's lasted 200 years. It's solid, solid, solid. 
none of this, you know, bumping into it and it falls apart because it comes unglued. Uh, it, it's incredibly well built. One of the thing, one of the cool stories with this house that that came along was uh, one day I get a phone call at the office from from someone I've known for for several years, and she said I've got something for you for the Gertrude Jones house. I'm like, okay, great. And she didn't want to tell me over the phone what it was, and she arrives with these two big boxes. And what she had was two boxes of the door hardware, locks, hinges, keys, some of it brass, some of it uh, forged iron. And there was a situation where in the 19, early 1970s, with the permission of the owner, she had taken it out because she feared that it would get stolen. The house sat vacant for, for several years, and she was afraid that the house would be vandalized and the, the hardware would be, be stolen. So she took it out, stored it. She moved three or four times and kept it in her attic all the way along, then gave it back to us. We gave it to, to Matt Hobbs, who then figured out which door each of these locks went on and so forth, and he and his father got cleaned up. And they're just gorgeous. I love that story. That is fantastic. Yeah, she held on to it for decades. Mm-hmm. That is wonderful. Wonderful. What a nice surprise! And she didn't. She did not want to be identified because, even though she had done it with permission, you know, she didn't want anybody to think she had stolen it or anything like that. Um, she had had permission to take it out. She took it out with the the best of intentions, and it ended up playing out beautifully. After all of this, you're having a celebration coming up soon. Well, we're going to have a, what we're calling Bubbles and Brews brunch. We're going to have some champagne. We're going to have some local brews. We'll have some food. Empire Eats is going to be the caterer. The brunch on Sunday, September 10th from 11 to 3 uh, at the house. We'll have a tent there and tables and all that good stuff. And people will have plenty of time to go look at the house on their, you know, on their own take their time and look at it while enjoying some good food and something to drink. So Sunday, September 10th, they'll be 11 to 3. They can find out more about it by going to preservationnc.org. We hope to have a sellout. When we opened the house before the move, we had nearly 700 people show up. So we hope at least half those people will show up back up again and to see it in its restored state. I think it'll be very well attended, and it's well worth the celebration. Bubbles, Brews, and Brunch on September 10th, preservationnc.org to find out more and buy a ticket. Is that it? Anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? I think that's got to appreciate the chance to do this. You've been listening to a discussion about the historic Crabtree Jones House located in Raleigh, North Carolina, with Myrick Howard, President of Preservation North Carolina. This is Paul Setliff with ERA Dream Living Realty, and we thank you for listening.